1992 NCAA Championship video is brought to you by Rawlings, maker of the official ball for NCAA Basketball Championships. There he is, there he is, right there, right there. No, what in the world is going on out there? Come on. We can't run this play if you can't get open. Now, come on, let's go. Try it again. A lot goes into the making of a champion. The same is true of the products they choose to play with. Rawlings. All right, that's more like it. Let's see if we can do it again. A never-ending commitment to excellence. In this, the 100th year of basketball, four teams fulfilled a dream and came to the lakes of Minneapolis, where college basketball would determine a champion. It's the story of Duke's back-to-back -back titles. Blue Rain, the official 1992 NCAA championship video. Each year at the beginning of the college basketball season, every team has a dream. First, it's a dream just to play well enough to get into the NCAA Basketball Championships. As the wins keep coming, the dream gets even more ambitious, and soon, sights are set on the Final Four. Most don't make it, but the fortunate four who do can still dream about taking home the holy grail of college basketball. The 1992 tournament got off to a typically rousing start. Terry DeHare provided the first buzzer beater in the very first game. And then, as we've come to expect, the upsets followed. As the field narrowed from 64 to 16, dreams were dashed as favorites fell. Lou Carnesecca of St. John's lost his last game as a coach as 10th seeded Tulane made its first NCAA appearance, a memorable one with a 61-57 win. In the West, 13th seeded Southwestern Louisiana beat Oklahoma to advance against New Mexico State, the 12th seed who had upset DePaul. But the biggest surprise in the first round came in the Southeast when third seeded Arizona fell to 14th seeded East Tennessee State. It was, however, little surprise that Shaquille O'Neal came away with the most impressive individual performance of the first round. O'Neal blocked an NCAA tournament record 11 shots in the Tigers' 94-83 win over Brigham Young. 
In round two, the upsets continued with the University of Texas at El Paso pulling off the biggest. Now the driving stops on the glass, yes. Led by Johnny Melvin, the Miners frustrated Kansas with a patient offense and unnerved the Jayhawks with a tenacious defense to come away with a stunning 66-60 win over the number one seed in the Midwest. Good follow by Ralph Davis. Davis, yes. That's it. What a game. In that region's upsets didn't stop there. Sixth seeded Memphis State knocked off the three seed Arkansas. Gets his own rebound. Basket is good. Memphis State wins the game. Then seventh seeded Georgia Tech upset second seeded USC. Even after the Trojans seemed to have won the game when they took a two-point lead with just seconds to play. Despite the upsets in the Midwest, after the tournament's first four days, 11 of the top 16 seeds still advanced to the Sweet 16. Two of the underdogs, however, met in the Midwest Regional Semifinal, where neither Memphis State nor Georgia Tech was ready to give up on its unlikely Final Four quest. Georgia Tech led early, but Anthony helped Memphis State get back into the game. And when Tech faltered down the stretch, the Tigers came back to tie. The lead is two. Billy Smith ties the game. Ten seconds to go. The game would eventually go into overtime, where Memphis State would hold on for an 83-79 win and a date with Cincinnati in the round of eight. Out West, top-seeded UCLA easily beat both Robert Morris and Louisville and then faced surprising New Mexico State in the regional semifinals. As the lowest seed still remaining in the tournament, the 12th-seeded Aggies had beaten both DePaul and Southwestern Louisiana to advance to the round of 16 for the first time since 1970. But UCLA proved to be too tough as Don McClain led the Bruins to an 85-74 win and a date with Indiana in the West Regional Finals. Another top seed that stayed on track through the first two rounds was Ohio State. After crushing Mississippi Valley State and then rallying by Connecticut, the Buckeyes ran into North Carolina in the Sweet 16. After struggling against Miami of Ohio and then riding themselves in a win over Alabama, the Tar Heels were making their 12th consecutive appearance in the round of 16. But on this night, they would go no further as Ohio State advanced to face conference rival Michigan. In the East, third-seeded Massachusetts fell 20 points behind Kentucky early in the regional semifinal. But as the first half came to an end, the Minutemen became the last-second men. Jim McCoy's 70-foot miracle had UMass thinking about duplicating its second-round win over Syracuse. And when the Minutemen pulled to within two points with five minutes to play, a date with Duke now seemed possible. But the Minutemen lost momentum when coach John Calipari was hit with a technical foul and Kentucky pulled away to a meeting with Duke in the regional finals. Ultimately, of the four teams that made it to Minneapolis, only one was a top seed. A fitting testament to a tournament that was so wide open to begin with. From the Midwest came the fourth seed, Cincinnati. All year long, the Bearcats badgered their opponents with a frenetic style of play. And form held early in the NCAAs where Cincinnati walked all over Delaware and then Michigan State. 
but UTEP gave the Bearcats trouble in the regional semifinals before Cincinnati was able to take control down the stretch and hold on for a 69-67 win. In the regional finals against conference rival Memphis State, Nick Van Exel led Cincinnati to its fourth win of the season over the Tigers, an 88-57 thrashing that put the Bearcats in their first Final Four since 1963. Memphis State, From the West came Indiana, the region's second seed. Led by junior forward Calvert Chaney, the Hoosiers began the tournament by blowing away Eastern Illinois and then ended Shaquille O'Neal's college career. Despite the Shaq's tournament high 36 points, Indiana beat LSU 89-79 and then moved on again by beating Florida State thanks to a hot shooting Eric Anderson. In the regional finals against top-seeded UCLA, the Hoosiers dominated from start to finish, crushing the Bruins 106-79 to reach the Final Four for the first time since their championship season of 1987. Our champions of the West Regional and are the first members of the Final Four. Michigan made it from the Southeast as a number six seed. The Wolverines, with five starting freshmen, started the NCAAs with wins over Temple and then finished off number two seed Oklahoma State in the regional semis. Two days later, they took on the number one seed, longtime conference rival Ohio State, in a game that went down to the wire. In the over. Time, Michigan refused to give in to the pressure, even under the onslaught of State's All-America Jimmy Jackson. Down the stretch, the young Wolverines kept their poise and used their talents to hold on for a 75-71 win. From the East came Duke the defending national champions, and the number one ranked team all season long. In the tournament, Duke won its eighth straight first round game, and then its sixth consecutive second round game before playing Seton Hall in the regional semis. A close game throughout, the Devils finally moved comfortably ahead late in the second half, and coasted to an 81-69 win, setting up a meeting in the regional finals with Kentucky in what turned out to be an NCAA Classic. One step closer. Most likely the best tournament game ever. Oh, it was one of the best games I've ever seen. Uh, I think uh, great players made Every single play it seemed like they would rise to the occasion to make it bigger than the play before. Especially Christian Leitner, whose perfect 10 for 10 shooting night allowed him to become the NCAA tournament's all time leading scorer. With Leitner on top of his game, Duke took a 12 point lead with less than 10 minutes to play. But Kentucky fought back, and with Jamal Mashburn scoring 28, the Wildcats kept the pressure on. The two teams traded baskets and traded dreams down a dramatic stretch run. Mashburn for three. Yeah. With the score tied at 93, Duke had a final chance to win. The overtime, without a doubt, best overtime game. There were so many shots. Five lead changes in the last 30 seconds. Oh, he'll shoot one. You don't see those kind of things happen very often, especially in a game of that stature. With seven seconds to play, Duke led by a single point, but Kentucky wasn't finished. Woods. Shot, and it's an incredible shot and the first thing I think you have to tell them is we're gonna win whether you completely believe that or not you have to get that in their minds and on to the next play 
and um, here's what we're going to try to do. To be honest, I wasn't too sure, you know, who was going to win. Christian Leitner. I was supposed to stand in the corner and then flash to the foul line. And Grant was supposed to throw the ball to the foul line, and that's exactly what happened. When I saw Thomas Hill's reaction, it was priceless. You feel so many things watching the expressions of your players. Uh, it took a while for it to sink in. I mean, after we won, I still couldn't believe we won. Uh, Kentucky played a great game. And uh, I was just happy that I had the big guy on my side. I'll always marvel at how many great plays so many kids made from both teams. That's what made it a, a very unusual and special game. So on the first weekend of April, Michigan, Cincinnati, Indiana, and Duke gathered in Minneapolis hoping to fulfill a lifetime of dreams by winning a national championship. The site of this year's Final Four was the Metrodome, and on Friday, more than 30,000 fans came out to watch the teams practice in what has become a tournament tradition. emerge as national champion. As Saturday dawned, Duke was favored to repeat, but there were three other teams that hoped to do in the Devils in the Dome. It's college basketball's greatest day. You know, 20 days ago, 64 teams had a dream. Now we're down to four. Michigan and Cincinnati in the first game. Indiana and Indiana. We are Final Four program. Hey, the official Final Four program. Meeting on We got Indiana. Michigan, Cincinnati, Duke, UC, UC, UC. Saturday's first semifinal game matched the Wolverines of Michigan against the Cincinnati Bearcats. In its quest to resurrect one of the NCAA's most storied basketball traditions, Cincinnati knew it had to deal with Michigan's size. While the Wolverines, with their five freshman starters, were hoping they could cope with the intensity of both the moment and the Bearcats. We have to make certain that we handle Cincinnati's pressure defense, their run and jumps, their traps, and I think how we handle that pressure defense will be critical. We have to rebound the ball. We just can't let them dominate the, the glass. If they dominate the glass, it's going to be a long day for us. need to establish the inside game. They don't have the size to match up with Eric Riley, Chris Webb, and Juwan Howard, so 
That'll be our number one priority at the beginning of the game, especially. If we allow them to uh, split our traps and break our pressure, then uh, it'll it'll give them opportunities at easy baskets because they'll be able to see uh, some of our rotations and we need to rebound the ball really well at both ends of the court. It didn't take long after the opening tap for the two teams to settle into pregame expectations. Chris Webber scored inside for Michigan's first two points. And soon after, Cincinnati's defensive pressure paid off as the Bearcats tied the game at two. Webber comes right out of it and it's stolen away from him. Cincinnati will score for the first time on a slam dunk. The teams then traded baskets and streaks for the next five minutes, with neither the Bearcats nor the Wolverines able to pull too far ahead. Baseline right corner, King, three-pointer, and got it. Nothing but that's Jimmy King answers back. Now to King, flashes top of the key. He'll square for the three straight away and gets it again. Jimmy King with a second straight trade. Rose gets loose down the lane. Floater on the way, gets it. Taylor Rose down the lane. Goes to Jones left wing. He cranks up a three. Got back from the Bearcats. With 13 minutes left in the half, Michigan trailed by two, but the Wolverines scored nine straight points to take the advantage. Right baseline rose back to Tally. Tally drives in the paint off the window and in Michael Tally to the hole. His first basket. 25-18. Michigan on a nine-point run. They lead by seven. Their biggest lead of the first half of the night. Michigan's kids were keeping their poise and controlling the boards. But soon, Cincinnati's ferocious defense would become too much for the freshmen to handle. In a raucous three-and-a-half-minute span, the Wolverines fell prey to the Bearcats' pressure. Cincinnati, behind Nick Van Exel, Anthony Buford, and Herb Jones, outscored Michigan 11-2 to go on top by a basket. With both teams battling to establish their ground, the pressure mounted, and so too did the game's intensity. By the time the two teams stopped talking, Cincinnati had taken a seven-point lead. But Michigan scored four straight points to close out the half, including the dunk by Weber as the Wolverines pulled to within three. Turnovers the first half were killing. They had eight more shots than we did, and we gave them too many easy baskets. The result, many of them from the turnovers. 
Actually, 16 of Cincinnati's 41 points came directly from Michigan turnovers. Clearly the difference in the game and in the Bearcats' lead. When the second half began, there wasn't much reason to believe that the Wolverines had learned from their first half mistakes. A few more quick turnovers and Cincinnati led by seven with 15 minutes left in the game. But Michigan rallied once more. And when Jalen Rose hit this jumper, the game was tied at 54. With time now winding down, the freshman-dominated Wolverines got a needed lift from an unexpected source, junior James Voskel, who in the tournament's previous four games had averaged under a point a game. Voskel down the lane, Scooper on the way, high off the glass, and in, count the basket, James Voskel! He'll go to the free throw line! Acrobatic move by James down the lane! Before the games, you have to have a mental mindset that, uh, hey, uh, you could go in and, and be a vital part of the game and I, I guess that's the way I approached every game in the tournament And so that's the way I approached the game that if coach Fisher did decide to uh, put me in the game I had to have confidence in myself and just go out and do the best I can Down the stretch Voskel's best continually kept Michigan ahead gets it. James Voskel has nine off the bat. Oh my 68 60. A starter as a sophomore, James Voskel's experience off the bench as a junior had steadied the Fab Five's nerves, and once ahead, Michigan never relinquished its lead. In the end, Michigan survived the Bearcats' pressure defense and turned a 46-30 edge off the boards into a 76-72 win. For the first time in the history of the tournament, five freshman starters had made it to the championship game. The day's second semifinal matched Duke against Indiana. The much-awaited duel between coaches Bobby Knight and Mike Krzyzewski got off to a surprisingly lopsided start. The Hoosiers scored early and often and were also doing everything defensively they needed to do to beat Duke. Indiana shut down Christian Leitner, holding the Duke star to just four first half points while exploding on offense during the first 10 minutes of the half. Anderson fakes, drives to the paint, pulls up, fires, and got the roll. Into the paint, pulls up, fires it off the counter, and a slam dunk. Backboard on the move, right side to Henderson. Allen lost the long jumper, by and hits it. Wow. Duke, in fact, might have been blown off the court if not for the play of its junior point guard, Bobby Hurley. Bobby Hurley dancing all over that foul. I don't think we win against Indiana without Hurley. I mean, Hurley had one of those magnificent games. He, he was playing at a much higher level than any of our players during the first half. Hurley hit four three-pointers in the first half alone on his way to 16 points in the first 20 minutes. Hurley to the left side, got it! Bobby. But Indiana kept coming, and with just under three minutes left in the first half, the Hoosiers went on top by 12. Duke looked out of sync and in real danger of letting the game slip away. But with just over a minute to play in the half and the Devils down by 10, Duke started to turn the game around. Duke being so tough at. Oh, and he hits it. Thomas Hill. Put him on the line for one more. Uh, they outplayed us by more than five points. We were really lucky to only be down by five points. And at halftime, we talked to our players about matching Bobby's level of play. Um, and I thought they did. For both Duke and Indiana, the second half began like the first ended. 
But to make matters even worse for the Hoosiers, Damon Bailey, who had scored nine first half points, picked up two quick fouls and went to the bench with four. Knight just got called for a technical foul. A frustrated Bob Knight was then assessed his first technical of the tournament as the Hoosiers' hopes of a national championship slowly but steadily started to slip away. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong for Indiana in the opening two and a half minutes of the second half. They have called on some courage. The defending champs are showing what they're made of here. Led by Bobby Hurley, Duke scored the half's first 13 points, part of an 18 to nothing run that had spanned both halves. We were able to cut um, the 12 point deficit that we had in, in the first half down to five at halftime. I think that was very important. And then uh, the way we came out in the first four minutes of the second half was excellent. And I think that was key. Draws the foul and no signal. That's going to be on Henderson, I believe. And Bob Knight's got to be thinking time out here. To Hurley, Bobby, three on two, Tony Lang layup, Kennedy's foul on the play! Oh, yeah. <laughs> the rebound, oh. captured, lost, picked up, put back up, and a whistle, offensive foul call on Indiana. Ryan Davis stood in there to take that charge. It's number six against the Hoosiers this half. And Hurley now gets it back to Grant Hill, down low to Parks, puts it up in a slam, and a foul call, and David Bailey just fouled out. It has been all Duke in the second half. Finally, seven minutes and 11 seconds after it had begun, Indiana's frustrations ended. Three-pointer gone! Craig Graham hits the first shot of the second half for IU, and it comes with about six minutes and 20 seconds gone. But the relief was only temporary. Not the pass you want if you're Indiana. Trying to make a solid comeback. Duke continued to flex its mighty muscles, and by the time the Devils were through, they had outscored Indiana 26-9 to take a 12-point lead with just under eight minutes to play. Still underneath. What did he put it back up quickly? Kobe gets the screen, fires a three, swish! Bobby Hurley is six three-footer for the ball game. Duke looked to be in total command, and as Indiana began to lose its starting five to fouls, the Devils seemed to have the game in hand. But Indiana refused to quit, and with just over two and a half minutes to play, the game's biggest news was yet to come. The Duke Blue Devils. Reynolds inside for Graham, and he scores. Nice, Within a minute, the Hoosiers had cut Duke's 10-point lead to five and kept the pressure on. Bobby Hurley double-teamed. They go to the floor. No foul. Call. Indiana takes them all away. Now, down low right to Keller. Cheney drives in, pulls up, fires. No good. An off-balance shot. They're going to call a foul on Indiana. And I think that'll be, let's see. It's on Graham, and he's gone. With another of Indiana's starters lost to fouls, it was up to Marty Clark of Duke to keep the Devils ahead. Boy, it is so tough to come off of that bench without having the good sweat and make these key free throws. And he hits the low. Big two there. With 40 seconds left to play, Duke now led by eight, and Indiana's comeback looked to be through until Todd Leary came off the bench to hit two threes and single-handedly give the Hoosiers hope. Down the other end, Clark kept hitting his foul shots, but Indiana just refused to let the clock run out on its season. Leary, can he do it one more time? My goodness! Hey, this is legendary! This is Hoosiers! This is the movie coming to life! With 25 seconds to play, Duke's lead had been trimmed to three, and the Hoosiers were about to get another chance.
Almost incredibly, Duke had squandered its seemingly safe lead, and Indiana, now playing without four of its starters, still had an opportunity to tie the game. Joe Smith puts up the sign. Do you believe in miracles? We're down to 20 seconds. Reynolds drives, passes right, three-pointer by Meeks. But with 13 seconds left in the game, Jamal Meeks missed the three-pointer. And several free throws later, Duke had escaped with a three-point win. Duke will play Monday night for back-to-back -back national championships. The Blue Devils moved into the championship game for the third time in the last three seasons. Bobby Hurley had tied his career high with 26 points and helped send Indiana off into the night. Duke might have won the game, but its chance to repeat as national champions were set back when senior captain Brian Davis injured his ankle early in the second half. Brian Davis may be hurt, 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 hurt. Brian Davis has sprained his left ankle. Ankle. Playing in pain, Davis managed to stay in the game throughout Duke's second half streak. But by night's end, it was doubtful if he would be able to play effectively in Monday's championship game. The promise of victory and a second national championship in the last four years had Michigan's fans in a festive mood on Monday afternoon. Later that night, they would head to the Metrodome for the 1992 championship final between Duke and Michigan. The scene was set for a classic college confrontation, and both the Fab Five from Michigan and Duke's defending national champions knew exactly what they had to do to take control of the night. We've got to contain uh, Bobby Hurley. Somehow control Rose. He's a very unique player. Leitner inside, uh, one guy can't stop him, at least not one of our guys. Established Leitner much better than we did against Indiana. We need to make certain we get great shots, not good shots, but great shots. Defensively, to me, the most important thing is to be able to limit their second shots. More than the marquee individual matchups, it would be just a great game between two very good teams. And the 1992 championship game is underway. Right from the start, Michigan's freshmen refused to be intimidated by the magnitude of the moment or the quality of their opponent. Duke might have been number one, but to the fearless Wolverines, they were definitely beatable. On this night, Duke started slowly, but when Bobby Hurley hit a three-pointer five minutes into the game, the Devils finally seemed on their way, especially when they took the lead moments later on another three by Thomas Hill. Thomas Hill now to Grant Hill. Grant slashing inside, dumps it behind him with Thomas. He's open for the three, yes! Thomas Hill has a three-pointer. In an overtime loss to Duke earlier in the season, Michigan had fallen far behind in the first half. But this time, when the two teams picked up the pace, the Wolverines kept the game close. Hurley throws his 
waiting for it to come to him. Hurley down, puts it up and in with both foul calls. Howard turns on the short jump run away, got it. Juan Howard has five, Michigan back on top, 16-15. Jensen to Parks, turn around 15, put her good. Cherokee Parks took the shot, no good, and Grant Hill comes off with it ahead to Bobby Hurley. Bobby stops, pops, scores! Well, his baseball pass to Weber, can he catch it? He does, one step slam, and a serve with the right hand. Finally, at the end of an energetic 10-minute stretch, Chris Weber's sensational pass, which led to Rob Palenka's equally remarkable shot, gave Michigan a 24-22 lead with five minutes left in the half. Davis. A few minutes earlier, Duke had hoped that Brian Davis's unexpected appearance in the lineup would give them a lift. But Davis's injury proved to be too much to overcome. Also starting slowly for the Devils was the other senior co-captain, Christian Leitner. The first half for college basketball's player of the year was a nightmare. Leitner with Howard on his back, turn, sends it over, knocked away and stolen by Chris Weber. Back out to Leitner. Leitner looking to move inside his call for the travel. Two turnovers for Leitner early and three for the team. Leitner travel, already three turnovers on Christian Leitner. They credit the, the turnover to Leitner, so that's his fourth. First six minutes of this game, Christian Leitner's in a total funk. Leitner throws it away to Rose. Jim, that is Leitner's fifth turnover of the game. No point, five turnovers. Unbelievably, overall in the first half, Christian Leitner had just five points and a season-high seven turnovers been a lot of double teaming of me when I'm inside the lane on offense and uh, Michigan was doing that and they were just doing a good job and I was making uh, poor decisions once I had the ball in my hands and I was throwing a lot of balls away. In a rare show of displeasure with his star center, coach Mike Krzyzewski actually benched Leitner three separate times in the first 20 minutes. And when Jalen Rose hit this shot, Coach K's Devils had fallen behind at the half for the second time in the final four. First half with the score, Michigan 31, Duke 30. Michigan was doing everything it needed to do to win the game. With just one half of basketball left in the season, Krzyzewski had every reason to be concerned about Leitner's timid start and the Wolverines' aggressive play on both ends of the court. Michigan plays real good defense. They're good athletes and they play hard. And I thought it knocked us back. We, they were beating us on defense. Our, our offense wasn't screening as well. And I, I thought they forced a number of the turnovers. It wasn't just us throwing the ball away. It was one of those halves where it was completely different than Christian. And so we were trying to talk to him, yell at him, uh, do some things X and O wise, but nothing seemed to help. For Duke, an improved Christian in the second half would definitely be better late than never. It'll be interesting to see how he responds in what is going to be the last half of his collegiate career. It didn't take too long to find out that Christian Leitner would respond positively to the challenge, nor, for that matter, was it very surprising. Fort Leitner, 4-3, yes! Christian Leitner comes out. Within the first minute of the second half, Leitner had scored more points than he had in the entire first half, but Michigan managed to stay in the game. Weber's basket narrowed the Duke lead to two, but over the next seven minutes, the Devils built their largest lead of the game. Hill goes all the way underneath, dumps it off, Tony Lang Point perimeter, looks for Leitner to pop outside, he does, turns for the three, bottom! Christian Leitner's second three has put the Blue Devils up 46 to 39. But Michigan had come too far to hide, and just a minute later, the Wolverines again closed to within three. It was, however, as close as Michigan would get. With Duke leading 48-45 and a little over seven minutes remaining, Grant Hill led the Blue Devils' final charge. 
It was Vintage Duke, a thoroughly dominating seven-minute, 23-6 run that clinched the national championship. Leitner on a drive, can handle it. Oh, what a finish! Ball goes to Grant, turns, drives down inside, all the way underneath, reverse layup, go! Yeah! Curley will get to the offense quickly. Sends a pass left side, it goes to Grant Hill, driving underneath, reverse! This time, the title had eluded Michigan, but the Wolverines and their five fabulous freshmen had come much further than anyone had expected. During a memorable three-week span, Michigan had taken the basketball world by storm and was just one win away from a national championship. For the second straight year, that championship would go to the reigning kings of college basketball had overcome adversity, injury, and fatigue to become the first team since UCLA in 1973 to capture the NCAA title in back-to-back -back seasons. The game is over. The Duke of Destiny has won it. For the first time in two decades, college basketball has a repeat champion. Duke's dream of greatness had come true in Minneapolis. Challenged all year long with the promise of college basketball immortality, the Devils had done it. It was a fitting continuation of a remarkable run. A stretch of five consecutive Final Four appearances, punctuated by an unexpected but well-earned title in 1991. Individually, perhaps no other player in college basketball history made more of his NCAA career than Christian Leitner, the tournament's all-time leading scorer and one of the most clutch players in the history of the NCAA championships. Maybe the two most important free throws of his career. First one's good. Duke leads it 78-77. Leitner not only made the two free throws which propelled Duke past UNLV and on to its first ever national championship, took his team into the Final Four. All right, here is Leitner with the shot, and it scores! The first against UConn in 1990, and the second in this year's tournament in Duke's miraculous win over Kentucky. Puts it up! Yes! But through it all, through the spectacular endings and changing teams, there's always been one constant. Duke's masterful and respected coach, Mike Krzyzewski. The king threw out the devil's blue rain. I like the way Coach K went at it, where he said that um, we're not defending a national championship, we're pursuing one. To go wire to wire, number one, and, and really have four tough games in a row to end the NCAA tournament. It wasn't anything that was given to us. Our guys went out and earned it. I think it's something that we're going to need time to put it in perspective but it's absolutely amazing what Duke has done. In six out of seven years and two national championships in a row, uh, Mike ought to go up on the top of the mountain and stay there the rest of his life and let the rest of us have a chance at some things.
last year when I said I wonder where we would put the second one. We gotta find out now, don't we? I'm probably stupid for saying this, but I wonder where a third one might go. This has been a presentation of Black Canyon Productions. There he is. There he is.